Okay, so next up, we have got an incredible, incredible social entrepreneur. When she was young, she had a bold dream that she was going to do whatever she could do to end global poverty. And that is what she's... Oh, she's here on stage. <laughs> nice, she snuck up on me. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please give a hand to Lila Jana, please. <laughs> Excellent, super. So, I noticed as you walked up on stage, you have a tattoo on your hand. That's right. Can you show us the tattoo and what does it mean? Uh, it says Sama, which means equal in Sanskrit. Okay, equal in Sanskrit. Yeah. Excellent, so. Um, I have to say it feels kind of awkward to wear traditional Bavarian garb with another Indian person on stage. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably the most brown Bavarians. What, what do you in think, this area? by the way? Just real quick, what do you think? Are we pulling it off? Is this working? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a quick Q&A. For those of you who are interested in social enterprise more than just charity and the new models. In fact, the title of this talk is Traditional Charity is Dead. Excellent. So <laughs> we're going to use Slide You again. Um, and so if you have questions, please use bits. 16 in there, and uh, we'll get some of those questions up. But in the meanwhile, real quick, what's your story, Lila? How, how, how do you get to where you are today? Sure. So um, I wanted to share the story of someone that I met a couple of years ago whose photo is on screen. His name is, uh, is Ken Kihara. And when I met him, he was living in a place called Mathare, which is a, a vast slum. Uh, just in the middle of Nairobi in Kenya. And this is the sort of place that you could only imagine in a post-apocalyptic world. It's hard to believe that Mathare actually exists. And if we can flip to the next picture right after this one, I can show you what it looks like. So Ken um, had been orphaned in this slum when he was a young boy. His mother and seven of her nine siblings had died of multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis. And he was stuck living there and, and somehow managed to get a scholarship to attend one of Nairobi's best high schools. So he actually finished high school. And when I met him, Ken was so articulate, he could read and write beautiful English. And I asked him what he'd been doing for a living. And he told me, well, there are no jobs for people like me. I was living in this slum, and I was having to pick bits of metal out of this river. It's kind of a euphemism to call that a river, but that's a, basically a large open sewer. He was picking bits of trash out of the sewer and selling them to the local recycler to make about $2 a day. And there are a billion people around the world who live like Ken. Yeah. And so about uh, eight years ago, I was motivated to try to solve this problem, and I founded an organization called Samasource, which connects very low-income people to work over the internet. So we train people just like Ken to do tasks on computers um, in their communities, and the tasks are for major corporations, companies like Microsoft, Google, uh, LinkedIn, and a lot of the tasks that, that they're doing are in the field of machine learning. So today we have about 1,000 workers working full-time out of Nairobi, Uganda, India, Haiti, and rural parts of the US doing work for these big companies. And we, on average, move them from $2 a day to over $8 a day in a three-year period. And we've now done that for 35,000 people. That's fantastic. <laughs> yes, well-deserved. <laughs> so for you, as the head of a uh, social enterprise, uh, for those who might not know, and even just your own experience, what is the difference between running a social enterprise and a typical startup? So um, we, we describe what we do as a social business, and this is a kind of new category. We've typically thought about doing good as traditional charity, right? We give away free stuff, free goods or services to poor people. Um, and then on the other side, we have profit-maximizing business, whose job is to make profit and return that profit to shareholders. Well, now we're starting to see this huge proliferation in the in-between um, of B corporations. Um, so these are public benefit corporations that overtly have a social mission alongside the profit motive. Um, and we also see nonprofits moving into this space with the social business model. So we set up Samasource to be self-sustaining off of earned revenue. And uh, we actually became profitable in April of this year. But we can't distribute dividends, so nobody has any equity in the company. So it's almost as if a foundation owns a business, is I guess how you would structure it here in Europe. And to me, this is the future of social impact, because everyone has aligned incentives. And why do people, why do big companies uh, engage with you? Is it to do good, or is there some strategic moves for their own business? 
So uh, one of the companies that we work with is Glassdoor, which is okay. a popular employer ratings and review site. And I was on a panel with the CEO of Glassdoor at Dreamforce, the Salesforce conference last year. And he said, like, the best thing that you could ever here as a nonprofit founder, he said, I didn't even realize you guys were a nonprofit. We just hired Samasource based on the quality of the work that you do. And I almost like stood up and hugged him. <laughs> Thankfully, we got that on video. Um, but most of our clients find us through referrals, um, uh, or they, they meet a member of our sales team, and they learn about us that way. And it's only after they start doing business with us that they understand that we have a social mission. So the story that I just told you about Mathare is not what I would tell a, a potential customer. Okay. Um, and we find that the social mission isn't what drives drives them initially to us, but it's what makes it sticky. And we see that in, in many social, uh, socially motivated companies. Now, the refugee crisis is something uh, that is important globally. What's in the Samasource model do you think can be applied to addressing that issue? I'm so glad you asked. So several years ago, uh, we did a pilot in Dadaab refugee camp, which is one of the largest camps in the world. It's on the border of Kenya and Somalia. And it houses about 800,000 people living in, in really abject poverty. I had read about this uh, camp and read that a nonprofit had put computer labs in the camp. And I heard that people were actually taking remote university courses for schools in the UK. And I thought if, if we had a refugee population that was capable of taking these courses, maybe we could figure out a way to teach them to do work for big tech companies. So we did a pilot there, and lo and behold, the refugee population actually did better than uh, the group of workers that they had found on Mechanical Turk, which wow. is a similar platform. So we won the business, then we ended up having to shut down the program after about a year because of violence escalating in the camp. Um, so now we're actually operating pilots in, uh, we're about to start one in Lebanon with Syrian refugees. And um, we've also run another pilot in Dadaab now that the security situation has gotten better. And I think the applications of this idea of digital work are profound for that community. Fantastic. Um, I'm actually wondering if we can, if there are any questions coming in, if we can put it up. But just as we're putting that up, um, Lila, can you share a little bit about some of the stats? What have you accomplished so far to date, uh, to date with uh, Sama and the whole entity, and also at Luxme? Sure. So uh, we've done over 200 million digital tasks on our platform. We built a technology platform that basically takes these big data projects and turns them into individual units of work, and uh, and then. And so we've done 200 million of those now, well over that. Um, we've partnered with hundreds of companies around Silicon Valley to do these types of human input tasks. And we've moved about 35,000 people from an average of $2 a day to over $8 a day, as I mentioned. What's remarkable is that over 95% of people stay at that higher wage rate after they leave Samasource. So they're getting trained to do a new type of work. And, um, and that opens up, it's a gateway into the formal economy. Now, we're, yes, please do <laughs> clap. <laughs> yeah. It's phenomenal work. Um, I feel like this is kind of an awkward transition after President Underwood and Kevin <laughs> 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 Altruism. Um, this, this is a sort of hype, theoretical question. It's something I don't know very much about, but I'm curious. Universal basic income. How many of you know what universal basic income is? A couple of you. OK. So for those who don't, like myself, what is it? And what are your thoughts on it? So um, those of us in the international development space have been, I think, pretty frustrated by the traditional aid model, which basically holds that poor people, I mean, essentially, it's a very paternalistic model, right? We think, let's give people free goods and services, because they, if we give them cash, they're not going to spend it on the right things. That's the traditional thinking. And it turns out, if you actually study this, that if you give very low-income people cash, it's far more effective than giving them free stuff because they invest that cash locally, and that cash creates markets for whatever it is they might be missing, right? So if you're a local person who gets a direct cash transfer, you can spend it on, say, school fees, or maybe you spend it on school uniforms, and now all of a sudden there's an incentive for someone in that community to make school uniforms. So it's a much healthier way to stimulate development directly from the bottom than to hope that these things trickle down from the top. And so universal basic income is an extension of that idea of direct cash transfers. And I think 
It's the only thing other than work. Work is obviously preferable. It's the best way to get people an income. But if they can't get the income through work because, say, technology eats their entire industry, then uh, basic income is a really great alternative. And it's being piloted now in many communities in Europe. And there's even a pilot going on in the US. That's fantastic. Um, I know backstage you were telling me a little bit about some of the recent milestones with distribution. But I was wondering if you could share with the audience how you got distribution for Luxme. Right, so, uh, so I've been running Samasource for eight years, and when we became profitable this year, I got a little bit more permission from my board uh, to try new things. So I set up a, a new company called Luxme, LXMI, and it's a new beauty brand that's devoted to taking fair trade and organic ingredients to the luxury market. So I've been frustrated that so many of these amazing natural products that are harvested by people not so dissimilar from Ken, people living in poor communities around the world, they end up making it into beauty products that end up at a natural foods counter or in a mass market kind of retail environment. And the woman who buys creme de la mer or Dior, I'm looking around and I don't see as many women as, as men in this audience. Maybe we have about 25%, 30%. But the women in the audience probably know what I'm talking about. Um, you see all of these expensive skin creams at Duty Free. And if you look on the back and read some of the labels, you'll be horrified by the things that they include. Um, things like petroleum-based products and things that are definitely not good for you or good for the world. And I thought, what if we could take a truly good for you and good for the world product, but package it beautifully and get it on luxury counters. And so that's what Luxme is all about. And this year, actually just last week, I flew in this morning from um, Philadelphia. We launched on QVC, which is the largest home shopping network. I think in the world it reaches 100 million households. Amazing. And we launched at, uh, thank you, at uh, Sephora stores nationwide in the US. And this is the first time an overtly social impact brand is launching at Sephora. So it's Just give a hand for that. That is incredible. <laughs> I, hear, I hear a rumor, and again, if we can put those questions up, I hear a rumor that you might have eaten your product to prove? Oh, that's right. I sh yeah, I should <laughs> tell that story. Is that true? Um, so have you guys seen the movie Joy? Have you? Has anybody heard of that movie, Joy? Um, it's a movie about a woman who gets her product on QVC on these shopping channels. And, uh, and so usually you, you have to do kind of audacious things to get people to want to buy your product and to get this, the merchant team to let you on air uh, to sell your product. So I had a jar of our Nilotica, which is this rare type of East African shea butter. And to prove the point that it was really good for you, I served truffles in the meeting that were made out of the ingredient. And as the merchant team was eating the truffles, I said, guess what? You're eating our skincare. And they were no like, way. what? And then I, I took a spoon out and I ate a scoop of the, of the cream in front of them. And, uh, and they were like, you have to do that on TV. So That's unfortunately, the, the legal team didn't let me eat the product on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I love how out of the box uh, you are with your thinking as to how to push this. And there's some questions actually that are a little bit out of the box. And I'm just going to combine the first and the last question here. For, the, for those in the Bitcoin industry and for those in the news industry, how can they link up with charities? Sure. So um, I think the Bitcoin industry question is really interesting um, because there are so many barriers. I mean, the reason that poor people are poor is not, as some politicians would have us believe, that they're lazy and not working hard enough. The reason that most people who are living on less, you know, most of those billion people that I mentioned, the reason that most of them are living on less than $2 a day has to do with structural problems in the market, right? Uh, market inefficiencies that make it very hard to reach them, that make it very hard for them to contribute meaningfully to the global economy economy. Financial inclusion has changed that really dramatically in developing countries. Now you see things like um, mobile phone payments. In Kenya, most people transact through their mobile phones. It's far more efficient than getting cash out to really rural areas. So I think Bitcoin um, and blockchain technologies have a lot of potential to make things uh, more easy for poor people. Number one, um, and there's already experiments going on with blockchain, uh, making it easy, easier for people to prove that they have access to an asset, like a land title. Um, and I think Bitcoin could be used to, um, to transfer payments to low-income people much more easily and avoid the, the pain of remittances and, uh, and the cost of remitting money through traditional systems. Okay, very good. And what about for new startups? Um, a Bitcoin person in the audience somewhere. <laughs> um, for news startups and how to link up with charities. So again, I, I would define what we do as something very different from traditional charity. And um, 
I think that there are some really, opportuni uh, really interesting opportunities for new startups to have a social enterprise model. Um, so one of those uh, ideas could be including low-income people somewhere in your value chain. So one of the most interesting uh, organizations I've seen in the US works in rural communities. And they, um, they train low-income people from those communities to tell their own stories as a supplement mm -hmm. to, uh, to the traditional news. So even thinking about how you might reach into a community that's very different from where your typical news anchors might come from or your journalists might come from so that people can tell their stories authentically. Um, there's another nonprofit that does that in Kenya. So 60 seconds, final question. What can we do as entrepreneurs and founders in this room to go beyond the charity approach and the typical charity model? 60 seconds. So um, keep the altruism and the empathy, but use it to guide you into doing things that have a long-term impact on the problem you want to solve, not just a, a short-term <laughs> uh, impact. And I think the number one way to do that is to help low-income people move out of poverty by giving them work. So if you can create employment for low-income people in your community, maybe hire one or two people that you might otherwise not, not see as a potential hire and invest in training, or invest in nonprofits that, that do that directly. That's incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a hand to Lila Jenna. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.